Bueno, continuamos con la tercera charla de, de economías heterodoxas y contamos para ello con dos, dos académicos bastante prolíficos. Entre ambos han escrito 19 artículos académicos el pasado año sobre temas de, de lo más diverso. Tenemos a Ingrid harbol Graven, que ahora mismo es profesora de políticas y de desarrollo internacional en el King's College, es también eh, la fundadora de Developing Economics, eh, un, un repositorio bastante bueno para tener en cuenta lo, todo lo que tiene que ver con el, con el desarrollo económico y es una de las grandes teóricas de, del desarrollo contemporáneo, así diciendo eso no me quedo para nada corto. Tenemos también a, a, a Yanis de Fermos, que es, un, uh, que es profesor en, en la SOAS University de Londres, donde recientemente llega ha, ha Yun Chang, ha escrito sobre cómo decarbonizar los bancos centrales, sobre la interrelación entre las finanzas verdes um, y, y las finanzas públicas uh, de los países, así como otros tantísimos trabajos que invito a que, ambos, a que todos los todos y todas las oyentes contempléis. En los inicios aparecía el título feministas por una serie de cuestiones logísticas. En este caso, ninguno de los, ninguno de los dos ponentes de hoy son eh, economistas que toquen la rama del, de la economía feminista, pero sí que ambos son economistas heterodoxos, cuanto menos. Y con ello, Ingrid, you will have the first 30 minutes. Thank you so much for having me and for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I will share my screen in a moment. Let me just see. I had it here a second ago. Um, there we go. Um, so as um, like I said in the introduction, I'm a heterodox economist. So I'm going to talk about economics, but from an alternative perspective, from a heterodox perspective, and specifically um, on dependency theory, which I would say is a strand of heterodox economics. Um, and I put as a title here, outdated or, or just out of fashion, because very often, at least a few years ago, I think, I think things are changing a little bit now, but a few years ago, whenever you mentioned dependency theory, people often thought that it was something that was uh, uh, theories from the 60s, from the 70s that are not relevant at all anymore. So I'm going to make the case in these next um, 30 minutes that actually there are some useful things to learn from dependency theory. Um, and that actually those theories are quite helpful and quite useful as heterodox economic theories to understand uh, the world, especially from the periphery and, and uh, global inequalities uh, in the world. So I'll just talk, uh, since Maybe for some of you, it's not really familiar. I'll introduce heterodox economics and dependency theory first, and then uh, go into why it kind of fell out of fashion and what some theories about that are, and then talk about dependency theory as a research program and make the case for why it's not outdated by also talking about some how we can look at some empirical cases uh, through the lens of a dependency theory research program. So, um, First of all, before even going into dependency theory, I don't think even heterodox economics is something that is uh, very well understood. Um, there is quite a lot of literature about what it actually is. People who are outside of the heterodox economics um, bubble very often think that it is anything that's not mainstream. So, you know, any alternative theory um, and that anything goes as heterodox. I would argue that that's not really like there is actually like a positive definition of heterodox economics. That and that positive definition will depend on who you ask. But so uh, me and my co-author Carolina Alves put forward this definition a couple of years ago, uh, which is the heterodox economics is the study of production and distribution of economic surplus that centrally involves the role of power relations in determining economic relationships. So this stands in contrast to a lot of mainstream economics, which uh, doesn't um, look at power as centrally as something that uh, impacts economic uh, relationships. So you have a wide variety of heterodox theories, including Marxist and Keynesian and feminist and institutional. Um, so um, it's a very, very uh, broad and um, diverse um, um, body of scholarship. But uh, since I'm going to talk about dependency theory, I think it's also important to say that heterodox economics actually also has been critiqued for being Eurocentric and for focusing on theories that come from the global north and for looking mostly at the global north uh, and also for being um, 
uh, insensitive to things like gender, which is why feminist economics came about, um, and also insensitive to things like race. So you very often have Marx and Keynes and Sraffa and Veblen and all these kind of white male scholars in the from the global north. Um, so therefore, actually, dependency theory provides an important counterpoint to a lot of heterodox um, economics. So dependency theory, in some ways, emerged it emerged as an alternative to mainstream economics, but also as an alternative to what a lot of scholars in the global south saw as this Eurocentric Marxism, where they saw that you know some some Marxists were saying that they thought that the countries in the global south would, would just go through similar stages as countries in the global north, that capitalism would evolve in the same way everywhere, uh, which dependency theorists theorizing from Brazil, uh, from Argentina, from Mexico, from Egypt, were saying, no, nah, actually, capitalism is not evolving in the same way here as what it did in, in uh, England in the, uh, in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so dependency theory there as a, like a branch of heterodox economics also challenges some aspects of heterodox economics. So that is just to situate dependency theory within heterodox um, theories. Um, and um, then to say briefly about what dependency theory is. Uh, first of all, dependency theory as a term, I think is not very helpful in a way because it, it signals that it's just one theory, but actually there's many theories. And I put some books up here on the slide that you can look at, uh, which are by different kinds of dependency theorists that um, theorize from different um, theoretical traditions. Um, it's very often associated with um, Andre Gunder Frank, uh, Samir Min, Dos Santos, and Furtado. Some of you may know some of these scholars, and I put the books up here um, on the side. Uh, some of them are Marxists, some of them are neo Marxists, some of them are institutionalists, some of them are structuralists. Um, just to have one definition up, um, I put, took one from Dos Santos, uh, who says that, or said in 1970, and it's still very often used, this definition uh, of, dependency, of dependency. And um, so he said that it's a situation in which the economy of certain countries is conditioned by the development and expansion of another. So this is a very basic definition. It still doesn't say uh, how a country is conditioned or why it's conditioned. Um, and like what the theory behind that conditioning is. So it's still quite broad and opens, opens up actually for different interpretations of this conditioning. Um, and there is lots of disagreement. And in the, in the 60s and 70s, there were lots of special issues in, especially in Latin America about what dependency means, how it can be theorized, how it can be studied. And Samir Amin actually, uh, he was a, an Egyptian economist, and he, in 1972, so 50 years ago, organized this conference in Dakar, in Senegal, where he brought Frank Dos Santos, and uh, I don't think Portado was there, um, but uh, lots of dependency theorists to Senegal to have these discussions. So it's a very, very um, um, diverse tradition, but they were having a lot of debates, so they weren't really uh, working in isolation. The main camps that are often, like in the literature, you'll very often um, see the literature divided into Latin American structuralists and neo-Marxists, but there is lots of, uh, there are also Latin American Marxists and, um, and um, other, other, there's lots of disagreement within Marxism as well. Those are kind of the main camps. And depending on how you define dependency theory, you could also think of um, other theories as dependency theory, like for example, colonial drain theory, which was um, developed in India even before dependency theory uh, became a term. Uh, so that kind of depends on your definition. Uh, but these kind of basic ideas of dependency as conditioning is something that actually has quite an old legacy. So that is kind of a very, very uh, brief overview and we'll get more into each of these aspects as we go on. Uh, when I first started looking into dependency theory in a heterodox economics program, actually, it was not very well known and quite um, unpopular <laughs> in heterodox in heterodox scholarship. So it was like this is maybe now uh, seven eight years ago, um, but I think there's been a revival in more recent years, and I'll I'll get to that in a second. Um, but at that time, so seven eight years ago, uh, there were lots of um, uh, if dependency theory was ever mentioned in the news, it would be in this negative way, like the dustbin of history. Uh, or so this is a, on the right, an article from the Guardian where uh, it's likened to like conspiracy 
theory, basically. <laughs> so it was very, very often dismissed. In textbooks, it would often be presented as something from like an, uh, in a history of thought chapter, not as something that's relevant today. Um, so it was very, very much out of fashion. And I still think that is actually, even though there is a revival that's starting, it's still not something that is taught very actively in most uh, economics programs, even heterodox. Um, but here, so I took this from um, Felipe Antunes de Oliveira, tweeted about this <laughs> a couple of months ago. So I just took this tweet from his um, timeline. Uh, so he looks at Unscopus, which is a database with publications, and he looks at all publications that mention dependency theory in their titles or abstracts. And you can see here that, you know, it's very, um, there was kind of a boom since uh, 20, yeah, 2010s or so. So there is, you know, some, it's not something that is, you know, as um, popular as like, for example, post-Keynesian economics, but um, it's still, there is actually a lot of recognition that it has something to say, at least more scholars are engaging with it directly. It could be that those papers, we don't know what these papers are saying, it could be that they're critiquing it too, but um, regardless, it's more uh, being published about more. So possibly back in fashion a little bit. Um, before I uh, go into the relevance and utility of dependency theory, I just wanted to pause a little bit and think about why it went out of fashion, because I think that's also helpful for us to understand um, what is still relevant about it, if there's any of the critiques that we should take on board and think about, um, and also just in terms of thinking about why theories actually come and go in and out of fashion at all. Um, and because that is also relevant for how we kind of choose what theories to view the world through. So uh, in the paper that I published last year, uh, Beyond the Stereotype, uh, I categorized the different arguments against dependency theory in the 70s and 80s uh, in terms of epistemological critiques, empirical critiques, and political critiques. So epistemological basically are those critiques that criticize the theories themselves for not being good theories, for not being um, you know, rigorous, for not explaining things well. So one of the reasons for, there was a lot of epistemological critique of dependency theory. And uh, one of the reasons is, as Cardoso argued, that André Gunder Frank, who is one of the most cited dependency theorists in the global north, not in the global south, but in the global north. So he was based in the global north, which is quite different from most of the other dependency theorists. He kind of was very often taken to be a spokesperson for the tradition as a whole. And his version of dependency theory was a very kind of simplified, uh, maybe one of the weaker um, theories in the tradition as a whole. So a lot of critiques were Frank, but Frank wasn't actually representatives, um, a representative of um, dependency theory as a tradition because there were so many other um, scholars in Latin America and in Africa uh, mostly that had completely different approaches than Frank, but they weren't even kind of engaged with by the critics. So that's one uh, reason why um, there were all these epistemological critiques of Frank. Um, then there was also this misunderstanding uh, about a dependency theory being one theory, understandably so, because it's called dependency theory. Um, and you see this, there was a very um, a uh, famous, well-known, and widely cited article by Lull in 1975, where he argues that dependency theorists are confused. They don't have conceptual clarity. Uh, they say that dependency theory is one thing in one article, and then they say something else in another. But actually, those are, you know, dependency theory actually means different things, right? There were debates. Like, of course, they would say different things in different articles, because these are different people uh, with different uh, arguments in different traditions. So the Marxist would obviously say something very different from a structuralist. Um, but Lull kind of made it seem like it was just one theory that kind of was interpreted in different ways and was just confused. That doesn't mean that some dependency theorists probably were confused too, right? It's a very rich and diverse tradition. So you'll have stronger and weaker uh, versions of the theory, but um, uh, very often there was a misunderstanding about it being one theory and therefore it being confused. Um, there was also a very well-known critique uh, by Robert Brenner, a Marxist in 1977, uh, where he critiques uh, Frank and Wallerstein. Uh, so again, that's, and that's a very widely cited critique of dependency theory, but he's actually only critiquing Frank and Wallerstein is a world systems theorist. So it's not even engaging at all with the Latin American or the African dependency theorists. 
Um, so those two points that I have here on the on the screen, I think, are not really um, very um, helpful critiques in terms of actually taking the, um, the tradition seriously. Uh, there are some other critiques. It was critiqued for being tautological, for example, that dependency theories theorists would say, oh, you know, uh, um, we have we're dependent on raw material exports, so we're dependent, for example, or something like that. Um, there were some scholars like that that kind of make a circular argument instead of kind of trying to unpack, okay, but why are you dependent on raw material exports, exports to begin with? I think a lot of dependency theories uh, do actually go into the historical kind of causal relations, but uh, anyway, this is often brought up as a critique that is reductionist, that it's mechanic, that it denies agency from Southern actors. Um, so those are some critiques that I think are valid for some theories, theories within the tradition that I think you know, are important to take seriously, although they don't invalidate all of the theories in the tradition. So those are some epistemological reasons that were often brought up. And then the empirical reasons are maybe those that are more familiar to some of you. Um, so what the, very often you'll hear the argument that, well, you know, it's clearly possible to develop within capitalism because we can see that the Asian miracle, so-called miracle happened. Um, many countries developed within capitalism, so therefore dependency theory is outdated. So I think this is a, also a misunderstanding of dependency theory. They didn't say that it's impossible to develop within capitalism. Well, maybe some, like Frank, for example, might have said that in some articles, but that's that wasn't like the main uh, argument or the main conclusion. Um, so, and I'll show in a second how actually, so in that paper, Beyond the Stereotype, I go, I choose South Korea as an example to look at how we can actually understand the South Asian miracle, um, no, the Asian miracle countries um, through a dependency lens to debunk this critique. Uh, and then another argument that is often uh, brought up is that the world is so different now from the 60s and 70s. We have these far flung global value chains, um, which is completely different from the world that Furtado and Amin knew. So therefore it's not relevant anymore. Um, and also a lot of uh, developing countries have industrialized in some ways through these global value chains by moving from raw material exports to uh, low value uh, to um, industrial industrial goods, low value added industrial goods usually. So to engage with this critique, I'll look at Indonesia as an example, as one of the countries that is like very very integrated into global value chains. Um, to see if we can understand Indonesia, if a dependency framework helps us understand Indonesia's development. Um, so finally, uh, another reason why it went out of fashion, I think, is this political reason. Um, that like the reason theories go in and out of fashion is not necessarily because they're better or worse, but actually be for because of polit the political economy of knowledge production. Um, so, uh, and we know that as heterodox economists, uh, we know that the um, heterodox economics also went out of fashion generally in the um, in the eighties, especially in the seventies and eighties. And it's even a bit too shallow to say out of fashion because actually it was like a very political process that it was like violently actually squeezed out of uh, economics departments across the global north and the global south, um, where yeah many economics departments were shut down uh, or marginalized. And there's very few heterodox spaces for heterodox thinking left in the world even now. Um, so that is like a political reason. So dependency theory is a um, uh, you know, a sub theory within heterodox economics. So it was also squeezed out um, along with the other heterodox theories as well. So why did it go out of fashion? I've talked a bit about that. So now in order to think about whether it's still relevant, I want to define dependency theory. Um, so I, Dos Santos already gave a definition which was very kind of very specific and broad at the same time. When I was um, first going into dependency theory almost a decade ago, I did find the scholarship very confusing because there were so many different theories and not many definitions of the tradition as a whole. It seemed like a lot of the people within dependency theory were more interested in uh, arguing or debating with each other rather than kind of trying to create some kind of holistic um, research program. So that's why I, um, 
um, in order to even like what I thought I was going to be doing during my PhD was to kind of take dependency theory and explore an empirical example. But in the end, I ended up just kind of make, well, I also did some empirics, but I also one of the big things that I did was even just trying to organize um, and come up with a kind of definition of the tradition. So um, I use Lakatos for this. Um, he's a philosopher you know, who kind of has thought about how to define um, different schools of thought and how you like create the boundaries and stuff. And he argues that a research program is a collection of interrelated theories that have a common hypothesis that have like a hard core. So I argue that the hypothesis of dependency theory is, oh, whoops, that global capitalism tends to be polarizing, that there's uneven development, this unevenness. And then the reasons for that is what um, dependency theorists um, disagree on. So it could be you have some that are concerned with monopoly capitalism, you have some that are concerned with finance, you have some that are concerned with falling terms of trade, you have some that are concerned with unequal exchange. There's all these different hypotheses within it. Um, but the core thing is that they're concerned with this polarizing tendency. Um, so, and also Lakatos argues that new research programs don't necessarily explain the same questions better, but they might explain different things than the ones previously considered. So there's also, I mean, a lot of um, literature on how development economics has evolved. And if you look at sort of the mainstream of development economics, it's much more about poverty, poverty reduction, rather than about this kind of polarizing tendency of capitalism. So it's not like dependency theory was replaced with another explanation of the polarizing tendencies of uh, capitalism. It was actually that the research focus shifted with the rise of neoclassical economics. Um, so that's a, a brief overview of the research program. I also put here on the side that they often employ a method, a global historical approach, which I'll also talk about in, in the examples of Indonesia and South Korea, and focus on structures of production and constraints faced by countries in the periphery. So now that we have defined that, um, I'm asking the question, so how can it explain global inequality? So in order to um, respond to the critiques, I'm picking the kind of least likely examples. Um, so South Korea's development trajectory that's often used to debunk dependency theory and industrialization through global value chains. So let's look at them quickly. Um, so how can it explain global inequality? Well, let, let's look at the East Asian miracle. Um, so in order to understand South Korea's development trajectory, I actually argue that dependency theory can help us a lot and that there is a lot of um, kind of um, superficial interpretations of the East Asian miracle countries. Um, but if we go actually taking a historical approach, approach, historical materialist approach, that the dependency theories does actually can help us understand better what, what happened there. Um, and so Eckert has this book where he does this. He's not a dependency theorist, he's a historian. Um, but he argues that the way that capitalism evolved in South Korea during colonialism was in a way that where Korean businessmen were not really subordinated by the political structure that was um, uh, pushed forward, but rather that they were incorporated into it. So it's very, very different from how it evolved in a lot of other colonial uh, colonies. Uh, where it was very, very extractive. Um, and and I'm, I'm not making the case for colonialism here, but that I'm just saying that it, the way that these structures evolved, the way capitalism evolved was a very particular, took a very particular form that was very different from how it evolved in Africa and Latin America and other parts of Asia. Um, and this historical development laid the foundation for industry domestically that later emerged um, as a part of the well-documented developmental state um, that, yeah, that a lot of scholars have written about, including Ha Jun Chang, who I think many of you saw speak just an hour ago. Uh, also Alice Amston, Vivek Chibber and others um, talk about the developmental state, but not without, not always going into the history. I mean, Ha Jun Chang does that very well and Alice Amston does it to a certain extent, but very often what's taken from the developmental state are like the specific policies that were implemented um, in the 50s and 60s. Um, finally, another very important aspect is the um, external constraints that countries face that development that dependency theorists are very concerned with. And 
given the political situation at the time when South Korea was de developing, uh, South Korea, of course, is next to North Korea. So very, very important uh, geopolitical site for the US and for Japan. So they, uh, South Korea received an insane amount of aid and financial assistance, which relieved a lot of the external constraints they would have otherwise faced. So they had um, balance of payments deficits for decades um, that they were able to sustain because of this um, support. So that's kind of taking some of the lessons from dependency theory in order to understand South Korea and doing so, it's like difficult to see how South Korea actually debunks dependency theory. Um, so to look at Indonesia. Um, so Indonesia is very kind of integrated into global value chains. So again, it could be an example of why dependency theory isn't relevant anymore. Um, again, if we take a historical approach, um, looking again back to the colonial period, the way that Indonesia's um, social formations evolved were very, very different from South Korea. There was a very extractive regime in the colonial period, uh, which was about extracting raw materials. And we see that actually the five leading exports that accounted for 70% uh, of exports in 1900, uh, still did in 1990. So that's just to say something about like how the structure, the economic production structures that um, were developed during colonialism endured uh, in a very um, strong way, you know, they persisted. Um, but there were developmentalist policies in the 50s and 60s, which did um, open up some space for um, Indonesia to move up some of the global value chains, even though they then had to go into structural adjustment in the 80s, as many developing countries had to. So um, the historical approach, again, it kind of helps us see the different starting point from South Korea. Uh, in terms of production structures, um, it did, Indonesia did uh, upgrade successfully from logging to plywood in the 70s and 80s. Um, they had a lot of state support um, and there was a historical timing that was also quite important for them. Uh, they had resource endowments that allowed them to invest, make state investments. Um, but even though they were able to upgrade um, successfully uh, in the logging or plywood industry, uh, there, were, there was this persistence of low product productivity sectors on the, at the same time next to the industrial, more industrial sector. Uh, so that also brings us to this like dual economy that a lot of dependency theorists observed. observed. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, they had these resource endowments that made it possible for them to make state investments. Sorry, there's an ambulance outside. Hope that's not too disturbing. Um, so yeah, so some of these external constraints were actually relieved because of oil revenues. So they were able to use that, uh, but also a lot of geopolitical support from Japan uh, to finance import substitution industrialization. So they had like a window of uh, production even though in the end it wasn't really sustainable and they had to go to um, the IMF in the 80s. Um, so this is very different from the way a global value chain approach following Gareffi and some sort of mainstream uh, de development economists who are very often look at the firm and like how the firm, what kind of uh, policies the firm um, carries out. Uh, a dependency approach would take this more historical structural uh, approach which can help us actually understand both you know uh, dependent development or uh, underdevelopment but also kind of periods of more success um, um, yeah so that's very briefly on um, South Korea and Indonesia and I know I'm only have about five minutes left so I just want to kind of wrap start to wrap up um, so unfashionable okay fine or not necessarily unfashionable, but uh, not politically accepted. Um, but I would argue that it's not outdated. Um, there are these constraints to structural transformation and finance in the periphery that are poorly understood by many economists that I know now, you know, the Chilean government is uh, grappling with. Um, there are these hierarchies of production and innovation and finance that, you know, are real. Um, we see massive inequalities in the world which dependency theory takes as a starting point. So that, you know, that's already a helpful approach. 
Um, and as I would argue, it, you know, it, you can use it to, it's not a kind of a very deterministic theory as is, it's often stereotyped to be. You can use it to understand kind of different kinds of development um, processes like South Korea and Indonesia. Um, key aspects of dependency theory that I would argue are acutely relevant. Um, first of all, the structures of the global economy is very, the way that they analyze them is very different from how um, economists very often see like individual units as the main uh, starting point. So this is like methodological individualism of the neoclassical economics uh, or then the nation state, instead of looking at just the nation state or just the individual um, dependency theory draws our attention to this, these global structures, um, which leads to insights into how exploitation happens globally. And there are lots of scholars that are working on this today. I just put some um, uh, references on the slide. Uh, also, colonial legacies remain extremely relevant for understanding how finance and production operates today. And there's lots of scholarship on that as well. Then I put some um, uh, references here as well about how we can understand, like how finance operates, for example, in Ghana, some work that I've been doing actually has, uh, it's very difficult to understand it without understanding how um, colonial finance and how colonial banks um, evolved and how they, uh, the banks still have some of those um, institutional structures today. Uh, finally, integrating political economy and power into economic analyses is something that is key for dependency theories and also for all heterodox um, uh, economist actually um, and that is important to kind of understand the role of like the Wall Street consensus for example and how like the IMF and the World, World Bank are operating and, and create certain constraints um, and how like vaccine inequality for example you can't understand all of these things without uh, thinking about the role of political economy and power and um, finally finally uh, theorizing from the vantage point in the periphery is also very important, especially for countries in the periphery, uh, especially now that a lot of this social science that's produced in universities is very Eurocentric and takes kind of Europe as a starting point. Um, so in that sense, it's a good time to go and revisit dependency theory. Um, I don't think I have time to go into so much. I haven't seen anyone give me a time sign yet, but I can see on my watch that I'm at 30 minutes. Um, I um, There are some, I think, I, I think, okay, I'm, thumbs up, okay, cool. Uh, I do think that there are weaknesses to some of dependency theory and there, there are ways that it can be expanded. So um, I think that, you know, not, just because it's dependency theory doesn't mean it's rigorous. You still have to be like very careful about how you explain things and causality uh, to go beyond exploring just symptoms of dependence to actually like look at what are the drivers here? What are the theoretical explanations? Um, one thing that dependency theory is often critiqued, often critiqued for is to neglect race and gender and their role in uh, reproducing dependencies and how dependency also impacts uh, race and gender. There are some scholars that are working on trying to expand dependency theory to um, look at this. Um, and also, you know, in our, at our current moment, I do think that like talking about the environment is also very important. And I think that some dependency theories did consider it in, um, it's not the most well-known ones, um, but I think now it's really important to understand how, you know, environmental problems are hierarchical as well. And that there are these global environmental hierarchies that have colonial legacies um, that were produced by in a colonial and imperialist global economy. And when we think about solutions, Green New Deal or degrowth or whatever it is, we need to take these inequalities into account as well. So that is something that we can also learn from a dependency framework. So to conclude, uh, if you want to understand global inequality and constraints to production and finance in the periphery, a uh, dependency research program can help. It's particularly urgent now, I think, I mean, it's always urgent, but in the wake of COVID, all these inequalities became particularly obvious. Um, and uh, um, therefore, I think, you know, it's a, it's a good uh, opportune moment to try to think differently. Um, it's largely been excluded through a political process, but that doesn't mean, or, you know, because it's been excluded by a political process doesn't mean that it's not helpful or that it's not useful or that it's not a theoretically strong program. Um, and then finally, there are some critiques that I, you know, any research program should take aboard, on board critiques and see how it can, you know, strengthen and expand. Um, but I think 
what I tried to do in defining the research program was to kind of preserve the strengths and see what is helpful for us to take forward and, and then uh, and strengthen and expand and then um, deal with the weaknesses that of course would be there in any, any theoretical tradition. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to the next speaker as well. You can also stay in touch on email or Twitter. Thank you. Many thanks Ingrid, Janice. Now is your turn. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kites, and many thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor to participate in this brilliant conference. And uh, what I'm going to do in my presentation is uh, to talk about the links between finance and climate change. Uh, I will do so by referring uh, quickly to some recent developments that we have seen in climate finance. I will try to explain these developments from a conceptual perspective. I will draw primarily on two strands of heterodox economics, uh, ecological economics and post-Keynesian economics. But I will also uh, refer to the Wall Street consensus that uh, Ingrid uh, mentioned before very briefly. And I will explain how we can understand the role of finance in the climate crisis from, from a power perspective. Now, at the end, I will also try to, to say a few things about how we could develop an agenda that focuses on uh, the socio-ecological transformation of our economies and why it is important to put environmental justice at the core of this agenda. Now, before I do this, I would like to refer to some key facts about climate change that I think is very important to have in our mind uh, when we are talking about the climate crisis. And the first one is that we, we have a serious crisis right now and every tone of carbon emissions matters. Whenever we produce a little bit of more carbon, we create a very big problem uh, in, the, in, in, in our ecosystems. Now, in order to illustrate that, I have two graphs from the recent uh, report of the, the Governmental Panel on Climate Change. And in, in the first graph, you can see what has happened so far. So uh, over the last decades, the fact that we have generated so many emissions has led to the increase of uh, atmospheric temperature by about one degree compared to what was the case two centuries ago. And if you look at the projections of IPCC for the future, we can see that there are scenarios whereby we might have three or four degrees at the end of the century. And if we want to avoid that, if we want to achieve the targets of the Paris Agreement, we need to reduce emissions very quickly in order to, to stay below two or 1.5 degrees. Now, if you look at the other graph, whereby we have the uh, annual emissions of carbon dioxide, the problem is that right now we produce at the global level about 40 gigatons of emissions. And in order to achieve the targets of Paris Agreement, we need to reduce these emissions extremely quickly. This hasn't happened before. And it's very clear that in order to do that, we need to have very radical transformations. We cannot do this by just changing a little bit how capitalism works, we need to have very significant fundamental changes in the way that we produce, in the way that we consume. So the first key message from these graphs is that we cannot continue the way that we uh, have produced and consumed so far. Now, the other fact uh, is related with climate justice. And uh, in the first session of the conference today, there was a discussion about that. So what I would like to emphasize is that as we know very well, the, the responsibility for the climate crisis rests primarily with the global north. If we look at the data about cumulative greenhouse gas emissions, about 70% of these emissions have uh, generated by countries in the global north. Now, uh, the other problem is that the global north has generated the crisis, but the global south is experiencing the negative effects of climate change. And I have here as an example a table that summarizes uh, uh, some effects of climate change on countries around the world. And you can see here that the 10 countries that have been affected mostly by climate change are all countries in the global south. And we know that this might become worse in the coming years. So we have a very significant issue here. We have that the crisis has been created by the global north and now the global south uh, is trying to deal with this. What does it mean? It means that uh, first of all, the global north has the responsibility to reduce 
carbon emissions quickly. It has the responsibility to, to change the way that uh, uh, we, gen we produce and consume. And the Global South needs to have the space in order to adapt to this new reality. Because the new reality is a reality whereby climate-related events will become more severe and, and more frequent. I mean, even if we avoid uh, passing 1.5 or 2 degrees, we will still have significant changes in climate, and this will affect countries in the Global South. So this means that these countries need to invest more in climate adaptation, but they also need to, to get support in order to cover climate-related losses and damages. This is very important because right now there is no framework that allows these countries to get uh, support in order to deal with these losses and damages. So I would like to emphasize uh, these issues because if we want to understand the role of finance in the current crisis, we need, first of all, to be very clear on these facts. So what I'm going to do now is first to draw your attention to some recent developments that we have seen in particular in still banking. A few years ago, there was no interest from central banks in climate change, but this has changed quite a lot recently, and I would like to talk about this. And uh, after I, I talk about the recent developments, I would like to focus on how we can understand these developments. And I'm going to compare and contrast two different ways of thinking about uh, the role of uh, climate uh, of finance in, in the climate crisis. And I'm going first to describe the dominant approach that we can, can see in policy debates, which is how we can protect finance from climate change. And I will contrast this to the approach uh, whereby we need to take action to protect climate from finance. And once I do this, I will make some links with the Wall Street consensus. I will explain uh, this, uh, uh, this term, which has been coined by my colleague, Daniela Gabor. And I will uh, emphasize the importance of understanding the, the, the political changes that we see right now because of the Wall Street consensus. And finally, I will uh, uh, summarize some, uh, some quick uh, uh, thoughts about how we can achieve sociological transformation, uh, which will have environmental justice uh, at its core. Now, let me say a few things about uh, central banking and climate change. As I said, a few years ago, there was no discussion about the role of central banks in dealing with climate change. However, five years ago, the network for greening the financial system was created. This is a network of central banks and financial supervisors that uh, does research on climate change and uh, tries to promote the policy discussion about what central banks can do in order to deal with the climate crisis. And as a result of this, we have seen some changes recently. I have here two examples. I have the example of the European Steel Bank, uh, which decided last year to uh, announce a, a climate action plan for uh, the period until the end of 2024. And uh, this uh, uh, climate action plan has primarily as a name to, to, to protect the financial system from climate change. I'm going to explain this a little bit more in a bit. And uh, another development that is interesting is that in the UK last year, uh, we had that the government decided to, to modify the mandate of the Bank of England in order to incorporate uh, environmental sustainability. And what the Bank of England did as a response to that uh, was to develop an approach uh, that would allow it to green its corporate quantitative easy program. So this is something that we haven't seen before in a, in a central bank in the global north. And I think it's, it's a very interesting development. I'm going to, to refer to this in a bit as well. Now, uh, despite the fact that uh, in the global north, the, uh, the main way through which central banks try to understand climate change is by focusing on how they can protect the financial system from climate change. If you look at countries in, in the global south, and if you look at China, you will see that the approach there is, is, is different. And we have seen that some central banks have tried to use their tools in order to promote directly green activities that can contribute to the reduction of emissions. So if you look at the People's Bank of China, you will see that they have taken a, taken a lot of initiatives in order to promote specific sectors uh, that can increase the use of renewables and increase energy efficiency. If you look at uh, the Bangladesh Bank, uh, this, is, this is a bank that has taken a lot of action in order to directly uh, promote uh, green finance. So they use uh, green credit controls, which are not used in the global, in most global North countries right now. Uh, it's a kind of an industrial policy that tries to support the specific sectors 
that can uh, uh, help uh, towards the reduction of emissions. And if you look uh, at the Central Bank of Brazil, uh, you will see that they also try now to uh, uh, make some changes in the way that they understand financial supervision, and they have asked banks to be very clear on the environmental and social risks that are related with, the, with their loans. So uh, if we want to summarize with what we have seen over the last five years or so, we can say that there is an agreement on the fact that central banks need to uh, understand and consider climate change and they need to, to take some action. However, there is no agreement on how still banks should address climate change. And this is what I, I would like now to discuss a little bit more. So I'm going to present two different ways of thinking about the role of central banks in the climate crisis. And I will start with uh, the dominant uh, way of thinking in this area. Uh, I call this uh, the risk exposure approach because basically this approach tries to protect the financial system from climate change. And the idea here is that climate change creates two types of financial risks. The first type of financial risk is the so-called so so transition risk. And the other one is the physical risk. Now, uh, what is the idea behind the transition risk? Just to give you an example, uh, the financial system has some concerns about the fact that in the coming years, we might have some climate policies, like for instance, an increase in carbon prices that is going to penalize some fossil fuel companies. Uh, as I will show you later, the financial system has provided a lot of loans to fossil fuel companies. So if we have policies that penalize fossil fuel companies, the financial position of these fossil fuel companies probably will deteriorate. And then those banks that have provided money to these companies uh, might also experience some defaults, for instance. So these are the transition risks. Uh, these are the financial risks that stem from the transition to a low carbon economy. At the same time, we have that uh, uh, the financial system might experience some physical risks. And the physical risks refer to the fact that we might have more climate related events that are going to destroy properties of people, of, uh, of companies, and this might also lead to higher defaults. And again, the financial system might be exposed to specific loans that uh, will be affected by these uh, physical events. So uh, what we see is that if you look, for instance, at BlackRock, JP Morgan, the big banks, but also if you look at the civil banking discussions, you will see that everyone now is paying attention to these risks. And the problem here is that uh, this, these risks uh, might be important from a financial perspective, but the way that the financial system is, go is going to react to these risks can create problems, especially to countries in the global south. And just to give you an example, uh, if we have that uh, at some point, there is uh, this consideration by credit rating agencies that specific countries in the global south are suffering from climate change and therefore are more risky from a financial perspective. What we're going to see in the, in the next years will be a downgrade of, of many countries in the global south because of climate considerations. And we know that this can, uh, uh, lead, can, lead, to, can lead to some very significant crisis. Now, another aspect of uh, this uh, risk exposure approach is that uh, we need to have actions from central banks that are in line with the so-called market neutrality principle. And this is a principle that has been used uh, in particular in, in central banks in the, global uh, sorry, in the global north. And the idea is that whenever central banks try to intervene, they need to, to not distort the markets. Uh, for example, when they decide to buy some uh, bonds from, uh, from the corporate sector, uh, according to this principle, it's necessary not to change the way that the, the sectors uh, are represented in the financial markets. And this goes back to this idea that we don't want to have industrial policy. We want to have central banks that are neutral. Of course, in reality, central banks are not neutral, but they use this principle in order to, to organize their policies in a very specific way which is very bad for the environment, as I will explain uh, later. Now, if we follow this approach, what does it mean in practice? Uh, the current uh, policies that are promoted by central banks and financial supervisors include, for instance, this idea of climate stress tests. So central banks now try to conduct stress tests. The idea of stress tests is that uh, they develop scenarios whereby they can see how much the banking system 
can address the financial crisis. And now what they want to do is to incorporate the transition and the physical climate risks into these stress testing exercises. Uh, now, the problem with that is that, again, the emphasis is on how to protect the financial system from climate change, not to understand what role the financial system plays in creating the climate crisis. Another idea that is, uh, is discussed quite a lot right now is how to change financial regulation in order to incorporate climate risks. And again, the idea is how to have a financial regulation that protects the financial system from, from climate change. So what are overall the problems uh, with this approach? I have summarized uh, this on, on the slide. So first of all, we have that uh, there is no recognition of the responsibility of the financial system. Uh, now, uh, one way to talk about this is by using this concept of double materiality. Uh, the concept of that double materiality refers to this idea that the climate, the climate crisis can affect, of course, the financial system, but the financial system also affects the climate crisis. So we have this uh, in the relationship which we need to take into account when we're talking about the role of finance. Second, as I explained before, a problem is that if now the big banks, the central banks around the world and financial supervisors try to promote this idea that the financial system protect itself from uh, the effects of climate change, then they will stop providing finance to those uh, countries, to those uh, uh, small and medium enterprises and those people who need finance sometimes in order to adjust to climate change. And at the end of the day, there is a problem because this uh, exacerbates climate injustice, because we have uh, the financial system that has the responsibility for the crisis and now tries to protect itself from, itself from the crisis that it has created. And by doing so, it, it leads to more injustice. Now, uh, a different way to look at the role of finance is, as I said before, to understand how climate change has been exacerbated by the way that the finance works. And this is very important because we have uh, right now a capitalist system that relies so much on finance. And I have here a graph uh, which shows, for instance, the, the negative contribution of some very big global banks to the climate crisis. So many of these banks like JP Morgan, uh, Bank of America, Barclays, they try uh, to promote themselves as uh, banks that care about the environment. And when they do so, basically they talk about some green initiatives that they take, but they don't want to talk about this figure. They don't want to talk about the fact that they have supported uh, the fossil fuel sector so much. And these are data that refer only to the last years, but if you look at the past, it's very clear that there's a very strong link between these banks and the fossil fuel sector. So uh, uh, if we use this approach that I call the systemic risk approach, we need to understand the, first of all, the way that the economy works as part of the, of the broader ecosystem. This is in line with the tradition of ecological economics. And when we are talking about the financial system, we need to understand the relationships that the financial system has with the society, with the political system, with the macroeconomy. We cannot just focus on the financial system and, so, and uh, view this in isolation. So by having a more systemic uh, way of understanding the role of the, of the financial system in the climate crisis, we need to, first of all, to emphasize how we can transform finance in order to help addressing the climate crisis. And we need first to emphasize the role of the private financial institutions have played in supporting dirty activities as this uh, graph shows, for example. But we also need to talk about the implications of the policies of central banks. And here I have a graph, uh, which is from a report that we uh, wrote with Greenpeace a couple of years ago. And it shows the implications of the corporate quantitative easing program of the ECB uh, when uh, we have a program that basically relies on market neutrality. So what the graph shows is that if we look at the representation of carbon intensive sectors in the program, and this is shown uh, by the, uh, uh, the pink uh, uh, bars here, what we have is that uh, this representation is much higher compared to the contribution that these carbon intensive sectors have to Euro area employment, but also much higher compared to the contribution that these sectors have to the Euro area gross value added. So by following the market neutrality principle, at the end of the day, what the ECB has done is that it has supported more 
the carbon intensive sectors that have a better access to the bond, uh, uh, to the bond market and contribute to the climate crisis. Uh, now, if we, if we use this uh, approach uh, that emphasizes the, the importance of protecting climate change from finance, the first thing that we need to highlight is that central banks need now to focus on carbon neutrality and not to, uh, on market neutrality. They also need to, uh, uh, to take actions that would allow us to, to reduce emissions quickly, but also to do that in a way that is just, and, and I'm going to, to, to briefly talk about this in a bit. Now, the other thing that is very important is that when we use this approach, uh, of course, we need to emphasize that there are so many other uh, uh, aspects of the system that have to change. So central banks cannot save the planet, but we cannot just say that we can uh, have other fiscal policies, uh, industrial policies, distributional policies, consumption policies, and central banks will not do anything in order to address the crisis. They need to be, to be part of the solution. And when we are talking about the, the role of central banks uh, based on this approach, uh, we need, for instance, to when we have quantitative easing programs to exclude polluting companies, when central banks provide loans to, to banks, they need to take into account climate criteria. And also, this is very important, when banks uh, decide to provide uh, loans to, to, to dirty companies, they need to be penalized for that. Um, I have here an example of how we could decarbonize a specific aspect of the European Central Bank. And uh, the reason why I'm referring to this example is to, to say that this is not just theoretical ideas. We, we have uh, the tools to do this right now. Because in many cases, central banks uh, use as an excuse that they don't know how exactly to take climate change into account and they postpone decisions. So what we did uh, uh, with Greenpeace last year was to try to develop uh, an approach that would allow us to decarbonize a very significant aspect of the uh, Euro system, which is the collateral framework. Uh, very briefly, why is collateral framework important? Just to give you an example, when we had the, the debt crisis in Greece, one of the problems of the banking system uh, in Greece was that the ECB didn't want to accept the public uh, bonds of the Greek government as a collateral, which means that they didn't want to provide liquidity to commercial banks in Greece because they, they thought that they, they wanted to say uh, that the collateral that refers to the public bonds of Greece cannot be accepted. This was a political decision that didn't allow the banking system to work properly in Greece. Now, uh, right now, if you look at the collateral framework, you will see that it is possible for commercial banks to use securities that refer to fossil fuel companies in order to get access to liquidity. And this means that at the end of the day, the ECB supports the, the generation of, of more emissions. And what we try to do in this report, uh, I'm not going to describe this in detail, is to show that there is a way to exclude all these bonds that contribute to the climate crisis and include other bonds that uh, are more environmentally friendly and contribute to the reduction of emissions. And it's possible to do this right now. We don't have to wait until we have more data or until we have uh, uh, more information about, uh, about these companies. Now, uh, let me turn to the Wall Street consensus. Uh, this is a term that uh, uh, Daniela Gabro has used in order to explain the new consensus that we are seeing right now in development finance. And this consensus has a lot of implications for climate change. Why? Uh, first of all, uh, in order to make the connection with what I said before, if we, look, if we look at the Wall Street consensus, of course, this consensus supports the idea that uh, we need to protect the financial system from climate risks, because the financial system wants to find ways to protect from, from, from these risks. But at the same time, this consensus is, is trying to do something more, which is to increase the returns primarily from, for Global North investors because of the climate crisis. So it basically tries to exploit the crisis in order to increase the profitability of financial institutions. And this is an agenda that has been promoted by the World Bank. So if you look at the documents about the maximizing finance for development, you will see that, that what the World Bank is trying to do is basically to, to support this idea that we can deal with development if we uh, allow financial investors from the Global North to go to the Global South and invest in specific projects that are important for development. And now, uh, because of the climate crisis, they also say that we can use this approach in order 
to increase climate investment in the global south. Uh, now, how is it possible? Because in practice, the challenge for, for, for the World Bank is that it doesn't look very, uh, let's say, stable for a financial investor from the global north to go to the global south. So what they say is that it's necessary for governments in the global south to de-risk investment that is related with climate projects. So what they ask governments in the global south to do is basically to, to try to attract investors by offering them subsidies, guarantees, by changing regulation in order to, to allow this investment to take place more easily. And through this de-risking approach, the idea is that we can have uh, uh, that the finance is going to create uh, new development opportunities in the context of the climate crisis. So if we look at the features of the Wall Street consensus, the first and most significant one is that it tries to create a new asset class for the global financial system. And in most cases, this relies on this idea that we can have more climate investment by relying on uh, private public partnerships. Uh, and these PPPs then can rely on some loans that some banks can use in order to uh, get access to the, to the global finance. For instance, they can securitize these loans, which is a standard technique that was, has been used over the last 20, 30 years in global finance and create some securities that are very attractive for global financial investors. At the same time, the Wall Street consensus uh, supports this idea of carbon pricing. And here we have a very significant problem because carbon pricing is an idea that comes from mainstream economics. It assumes that we can put a price on carbon and then solve the problem of the climate crisis. We know how problematic this is, but on top of it, and uh, we have a policy tool that has been suggested for countries in the global north that is applied in exactly the same way in the global south. This is what the World Bank wants to do. So they want countries in the global south to use carbon pricing. And they want them to use that also because uh, they, they argue, they, the argument is that they can uh, uh, use these revenues from a carbon tax, for instance, in order to reduce their public debt. And finally, we have that uh, the Wall Street consensus wants to protect, as I said before, the financial system from climate risks. And uh, I think in the future, what we might see if this consensus uh, dominates, uh, we might have the central banks will act as climate rescuers of last resort. What does it mean? They will try to save the financial system and the financial investors in the global south if we have catastrophes from climate related events. So it's very likely that in the future, if this Wall Street consensus becomes the dominant way of dealing with the climate crisis, central banks will intervene in order to protect the financial investors and not in order to protect uh, the people in the global south. Um, and just very briefly to, to summarize, because I know I don't, I don't have so much time. Um, what are the main problems with the Wall Street consensus overall? So, uh, on top of what I just said, we have that this is a system that can create, this is a consensus that can create more financial fragility in the global south, uh, because it increases at the end of the day, the debt of countries in the global south. And at the same time, it relies on this idea that uh, these countries need to rely on global financial investors, which means that the, the countries will become much more susceptible to the global financial cycle. So we will have probably a lot of inflows at some point and then a lot of outflows. And we know how problematic this is. Now, the other problem is that the priority of the Wall Street consensus is to create contracts that look financially viable for the private sector. We don't have here a policy whereby climate projects are designed in a way that supports the local population. We have that the projects have have to be designed in a way that is conducive to the interests of the private sector. And, and of course, this is not going to, to work. And this might also create what someone could call a green financial colonialism, because uh, we have right now that the financial system wants to use the opportunity for them of the climate crisis in order to make more profits. And they want to take decisions about how countries in the global south will address the climate crisis. And a very quick comment on the carbon pricing. We know that carbon pricing uh, has several problems. One of, one of them is that it can increase inequalities quite a lot. And we also know that carbon pricing can have uh, more significant effects on women compared to men. 
uh, because, for example, energy is very important for social reproduction, and if we increase and uh, we have an increase in the price of energy, this uh, will have very negative effects on uh, the well-being of women in the global south. Uh, okay, in the last uh, few minutes that I have, uh, I will try to to outline some elements of uh, a social ecological transformation. Uh, that will put environmental justice, justice at, its, at uh, its core. And I'm not going to, to be very detailed, but I would like to say a couple of things. First, about how we should look at climate mitigation in the global north. And second, at how we can think about climate justice and the global financial system. So uh, if we look at the discussion so far about what countries the global north can do in order to address the crisis, again, carbon pricing is at the core. We need very quickly to on carbon and solve the problem. We need to have significant transformations that include green public investment, green industrial policy. We need to support sectors that can contribute to the reduction of emissions. We need to, to use uh, development banking in a way that is conducive to investments that are important for, 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 the, for climate. And we also need to use environmental regulation. Uh, if we take as given that the markets are not going to solve the problem, we need regulation in order to make sure that the decisions that will be taken from people and firms will be in line with uh, the Paris Agreement. In the context of Europe, for instance, if we think about Spain, it's very important, of course, to change this austerity narrative. We cannot have more public uh, green investment if we have this narrative that public debt is a problem. And of course, this is a very significant political issue that we have in the Eurozone. Uh, if this continues, it's very difficult to have the investment that is necessary in order to address the crisis. Another thing that is very important and was also uh, highlighted quite a lot in the first session today is that it's not just to have some policies that we promote green and uh, will penalize dirty. We also need to change completely our consumption norms in the global north. We cannot continue uh, consuming in the same way that we have done so far, of course, a very significant responsibility for consumption norms is related to rich people and we have to address this, uh, but we cannot just rely on uh, some uh, changes in macroeconomic and financial policy to address the crisis. We need to, to think uh, very uh, differently about how we consume. And another issue that is very important uh, and is going to become uh, uh, very significant also in, in the case of Europe because of the European Green Deal, is that if, for example, we want to invest more in renewables, we cannot forget that these raw materials that are necessary for uh, using solar panels and wind farms come from the global south and people can be exploited in the global south because we, have, uh, we, might, we might want to have more renewables in Europe. Uh, so we need to incorporate climate justice criteria in the way that we think about climate policies and we need to take actions to deal with the injustices that uh, climate policies can create. And in this context, I would like to uh, say also a few things about the role of finance. Uh, first of all, what is important for the Global South uh, is to have the space to make decisions about how they want to address the climate crisis. And uh, uh, for example, Keston Perry has talked so much about the importance of having climate reparations. If we recognize that there is a climate injustice problem, we need to have climate reparations that will uh, give the space to countries to deal with the crisis. And for instance, if we think about how we can fund these reparations, uh, one, I mean, there are several ways to do this, but we can also have, for instance, a dirty financial transaction tax, uh, which will penalize the financial system that has the responsibility for the climate crisis, that I, as I explained before. We also need to have debt relief programs that uh, do not rely on conditionalities, but rely on the fact that countries in the global south have to spend more right now because of the climate crisis. Uh, uh, another thing that is very crucial is that uh, if you look at uh, climate finance from developed countries to developing ones, in most cases, this climate finance has the form of loans. Loans create debt, debt uh, create financial fragility. In the long run, uh, it can lead to a crisis. So we need to have more grants that focus not only on how uh, countries in the global south can uh, uh, reduce their emissions, but focus also on how they can spend on climate adaptation 
and how they can deal with the climate related damages and losses. And the final thing that I would like to say is that when we talk about central banks in the global north, uh, one thing that is very important is that these central banks have a very strong position in the global financial architecture. The way that the global financial system has been uh, developed uh, has as a result that uh, the Bank of England, the Fed have currencies that are very strong and, and, and that are at the top of the currency hierarchy at the global level. This means that they can very easily print money in order to support their economies. But this is not the case in the global south. And if we want to be serious about climate justice, uh, we need to find ways to, to use this printing power that central banks have in order to support countries in the global south. So uh, we, uh, we can have the central banks in the global north can print money in order to support countries in the global south. And, I, and of course, all these uh, uh, elements of this agenda cannot be implemented right now because of the political environment. As I said, the Wall Street consensus is a dominant narrative about how we can deal uh, with the crisis. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to change that, but I think it's also important to be clear on what we would like to achieve. And I think that it's very, uh, it's, it's necessary to change the political environment. The climate crisis is going to become worse in the coming years. So we really need to have alternatives and to, to be ready to, 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 uh, to use any type of political power in order to, to fundamentally transform the way that the global financial system works. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Yanis, Ingrid. Let's hope policymakers take note of your, of your talk. And many thanks for, for being here and for your time. In a few minutes, we will be with, um, with Maristela Spampa and with Barbara Jerez Enriquez discussing lithium and the limits of the material limits of this planet. Thanks everyone for, for joining. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good luck with the next session. <laughs>